you're jumping around, you see him jumping into drills. I mean, you see Nick Sirianni working with running backs. He's go, he's trying to make them juke one way, tell them how to get out. You see all these coaches getting involved. And you saw you see it from time to time when it comes to these position drills. But when you see somebody using that much energy involved, say, hey, you know what? He's going to juke to the left and really get it on them. I think you really do see that a lot. And you hear it when you talk to a lot of when we talk to a lot of guys. I mean, you hear them say, they're really impressed with the energy. I think it's really starting to bleed onto the practice field. Appreciate you tuning in to Birds 365 with the Mac and Mac guys, John McMullen, Jody McDonald. A uh, quick programming note before we punch up our first guest of the day. Uh, Birds 365 is going to acknowledge the Memorial Day weekend, and again, uh, please say a prayer for all our lost sober, uh, servicemen over all these years at some point during the weekend. We will. We're going to be off on Friday and Monday. Nice long weekend for Birds 365. Next week, we'll get it going underway on Tuesday. We'll be here tomorrow, uh, but just want to let you guys know ahead of time, no Birds 365 this upcoming Friday or the following Monday. But we're glad to be here right now, and we're glad to be joined by Chris Franklin from NJ.com, who spent quality time on the grass yesterday with John McMullen. Chris, thanks for hopping on board. How you doing, bud? Doing great, Jody. John, thank you guys so much for having me on. It was nice to actually see football again. It, it yeah. was fun. <laughs> Did we see football, though, Chris? We saw a, a, a remnant of football and jerseys. Yeah, you know, I saw, I saw something flying around a couple times, you yeah. know, but that's about it when it came to that. <laughs> we got to see Devontae Smith play tetherball, which is interesting. <laughs> I, I like the tetherball contraption. Who, who knew that? And I know Nick Sirianni said he wanted to see some competition, but who knew they'd bring some schoolyards? I mean, they had rock, paper, scissors already. <laughs> right. I mean, you had a tetherball. Why not, why not add that? You hopscotch is next, probably. So who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you, again, we know that these are not offense versus defense drills. They are what they are. And you take what you can out of them. I would think that one of the things you're trying to judge, and you guys limited time in front of those guys, is just attitude. Are the guys happy to be there? A couple of veterans didn't show, like Fletcher Clark, Brandon Graham. But everyone else was pretty much in the house. Did it seem like an upbeat attitude? Were the guys happy to be there and spending the quality time in the gathering? Or, or okay, yeah, we kind of negotiated this with the union. We're supposed to be here, even though, quote, unquote, it's voluntary. Uh, what would you get as far as attitude while watching the guys do what they did? I thought most of the guys looked like they were pretty much into it. I mean, I even saw that one little interaction when the quarterbacks were working out, and you saw Jalen Hurts go over to Joe Flacco, pat him on the shoulder a little bit, and like they were having a good time. So I wonder. I think that they are engaged, and I think they're. I think they like the camaraderie a lot of it when it comes to some of the install. I mean, it's better than being out there in the zooms, but you know, on zooms and doing stuff like that, learning the offense. But it looks like they're engaged at least so i think that's that's a plus and that's a good building block going forward heading toward training camp yeah chris one thing we talk to these guys all the time that everybody to a man mentions the energy of this coaching staff i think it's real i think it's evident these guys and i think it was targeted by jeffrey glory for whatever reason everybody's got a shelf life in the nfl maybe it was time for doug peterson i don't necessarily agree with it but do you see that the energy of this coaching staff out there? Because it kind of stands out to me. Oh yeah, they're jump. You're jumping around. You see them jumping into drills. I mean, you see Nick Sirianni working with running backs. He's go. He's trying to make them juke one way, tell them how to get out. You see all these coaches getting involved, and you saw you see it from time to time when it comes to these position drills. But when you see somebody using that much energy involved, say, hey, you know what? He's going to juke to the left and really get it on them. I think you really do see that a lot, and you hear it when you. Talk to a lot of when we talk to a lot of guys. I mean, you hear them say they're really impressed with the energy. I think it's really starting to bleed onto the practice field. Chris, uh, when Jonathan Gettin had his first media availability last week, he said something that I liked a lot. Uh, I've <laughs> always believed that the best coaches don't have a stone cold philosophy, and they're going to make the players fit the way that they think things should go that there's got to be some flexibility in there where you tinker with your philosophy and your system and your scheme to fit the talent that you do or don't have on your roster. And Jonathan Gannon said just that. What can he learn about the talent that he does have and uh, their abilities and capabilities with these quote unquote drills that they're doing now? 
or do we have to wait until camp actually opens so uh, uh, next month when they can actually start to uh, come up with fits for a potential scheme or a system on defense? Well, a, well him's the saying that it begins a far cry from the Chip Kelly years where you see uh, see what happened. But I think a lot of stuff, I, I don't think a, you won't really truly know, I think, to see that 707 and 11 or 11. Because I think you build a lot of chemistry and you start to feel how guys play off of each other, in, especially in the secondary, where you start, if you know some one guy's going to jump on one route or another one. So it's not so much, you can learn a little bit, but I think a lot of it's going to be relying on tape and just, guys physical talents to see if they have speed to play from certain position going from one to another but it might be a little bit before you can see that i mean it's and even then when they finally install it may take a couple games into the season to finally see these guys feel comfortable enough and then go for and be at the best of ability so i think that's where they're at right now with it now chris kind of piggybacking off jody's question but the offensive side of the ball we got to talk to jalen rager after practice now i want to i want to get your thoughts on this because i took it one way he kind of said i'm going to play a lot in the slot and then to me backtracked really quickly and said "Uh uh-oh i probably shouldn't have said that (laughs) did you get that feeling or or am i making too much out of that i saw a little bit i also I also thought when he said he wanted them to learn all the different sp- a lot all the different yeah. receiver positions. I thought that was key as well too because yeah. that was almost a way to say, "Hey, you know what? Oh, it's not. Oh, wait, you know what? Well, <laughs> we all are going to be like X off to Z. Yeah. Also. So they shift around, shift around and come to that. I for him, I think the slot's not a bad spot for him to be I at. Think, I think he's going to be there a lot. Yeah. I really do. And using his speed, everybody knows his speed and. If they use a lot of these quick screens and him and the balls get swung out to him quickly in the slot, that that fits perfectly for him. He's got the speed, he's got the agility to use. So if he's in the slot a lot, I think that benefits him a little bit more. And you have Smith who's able to get off the line and use his quickness and his abilities to break press coverages. So I think that's forever. I think it helps Smith and I think it helps Ray. See, I read that completely differently because – uh, to me, him stating, I'm going to play in the slot. And, oh, uh, but we'll, we'll be playing everywhere because all the wide receivers will be playing everywhere. I read into directly into that, oh, wait a minute. In the slot, I've got to compete against Greg Board, the leading Eagle receiver <laughs> last year. The <laughs> top touchdown Ward, receiver right? for the Eagles <laughs> last year. Whereas outside, I'll be competing with J.J. Arcega, Whiteside. So, uh, yeah, okay, may- maybe I better skim that back a little bit. For my own good, so that uh, everyone knows what perspective I'm looking at this upcoming season. And now, I, Rager's going to play where Rager's going to play, and they, he's a former first-round draft pick. So if that is a good position for him, he's going to get a lot of slot time, which is exactly the way the, uh, Nick Sirianni should and Shane Sykin should be looking at going into this season. He seemed pretty buddy-buddy with uh, the newest Eagle wide receiver, Devonta Smith, and that they are looking at this as a one-two combo is Jalen Hurts in sync with that? Is it these three young guys coming together to make it a prolific passing game? I think so. I mean, Rager went down to Texas to work out with Hurts to get acclimated with him, and then we know, all know the history when it came to Smith and Hurts at Alabama. So it's important to build that chemistry early. I think you have to look at – it's all going to fall on Hurts. I mean, to be honest, you know, we know what – we know what Smith is able to do. I think when you look at, I think it's going to translate well to the NFL. And when you, if it hurts, is able to build upon his passing abilities, his foot looks. I mean, granted, we only saw most of the footwork and some of the, uh, uh, like a little bit of throwing, but his footwork looks a lot better. It's light years from when he first came in last year. If he's able to expound upon that and and become an even better passer in the NFL ranks, this offense I think can be surprise a lot of people as the season goes on you know it's interesting chris when i look at quarterbacks in this league especially young quarterbacks you can kind of figure out okay this guy can play this guy can throw the football this guy uh, can move uh, in the pocket he can extend plays he can do this he can do that your concerns are usually about the intangibles about the leadership about uh people following him I don't have any concerns with Jalen Hurts when it comes to the intangibles. Everybody loves the guy. Everybody gravitates towards him. Everybody follows him. It's almost weird because he's so young 
and he's got such a maturity. And I use Jalen Rager. You know, that's probably the perfect example. They're both 22 years old. And Jalen uses that term rat poison for social media and just stays away from it. And Jalen has had an issue, which we talked to him about, about Jalen Rager. I'm talking about two Jalens. Um, <laughs> you know, sometimes he combats people on Twitter. You shouldn't do that. I mean, it's just, it's affected him. You can see it. Hopefully he's learned from it. Hopefully he'll leave it in the past. But getting back to Jalen Hurts, it's amazing. Like, I have no concerns over the intangible stuff. It's just the on-field stuff. Can he be accurate enough in the, at, at the NFL level? I think he can develop into that over time. And I think he also had a small sample size. He, we saw him get significant snaps against the first – or against opposing first team's defense in those four games. And I forget – I did his story back last year at one point looking back at it. And you see the first – Four games were comparable to Russell Wilson away in the amount of yards when he came to him out touchdowns and even the interceptions. So the more experience I think he gets seeing these defenses in, in live action, it can get better. I think the only thing I'm a little worried about is his deep ball. That's the if they go more and more vertical. I think and if he's developed that and fixed that, I think he'd be okay. His I mentioned this earlier, his footwork was a little had, he was thrown off his back foot a lot when he first got in. And that really concerned me, but he was like he's got that down so if you can see if this offensive line can protect him if he feels comfortable we know his ability to run outside the pocket if he's able to step into the ball and, and ball. throw it downfield and find those throwing lanes because he's not the biggest guy so if he can find those throwing lanes i think he could develop into a guy a quarterback that i'm not going to say i don't think he's top 10 ish but I, right now but i think he could develop into like a top 12 top 13 type of guy and that and with the offensive pieces around him i think that's all you need for the moment Chris, let me tell you a, a comparable story to something you guys dealt with yesterday that I dealt with, oh, more than a decade ago, uh, that is much like the Eagles situation now. John just told me before the show started, damn, Joe Flacco can still throw the football, that uh, he's still got a <laughs> solid arm on him. He might not be the quarterback that won the Super Bowl years ago, but damn, he can still spin it. Uh, I remember being at Jet Camp years ago, and the Jets were grooming uh, their, their young quarterback, uh, Chad Pennington, uh, to take over and be their guy. And Vinny Testaverde was still on the roster. And Vinny could just throw it. He had one of the best arms I've ever seen live, just purely off the ear, cock it, 30 yards on a line. And you watch these two guys work out in drills, and you go, wait a minute, we're going to start that guy rather than this guy here? Just because one could throw it so much better. And to Pennington's credit, he took the competition. He loved it. He and Vinny actually got along really well, and he knew it was his time. He knew he was going to be given the chance, and he used it to motivate himself. We're in a similar situation here in Philadelphia this year. We know Jalen Hurts is the guy. We know that's what the Eagles want, although the coach refuses to call him the starter. We all believe he's going to be the starter, uh, and Flacco will be the backup here. Can Hurts take the kind of pressure? It's just a visual thing that you do in practice from a guy, a strong-armed veteran backup, can he take that and use that? I think so. And and, and I think it's also the ability, his leg ability helps the offense a lot more. I mean, you see the arm, you see Flacco's arm, and, and there's no thing, it's strong. He, he was putting some things on his zips, like flat footy yesterday. I was like, okay, yeah, this guy can still play a little <laughs> bit. But even even if Hurts doesn't have that strong of an arm as Flacco, he can do so much, so many other things well. I mean, his threat, his threat of running just opens up this offense completely. I mean, it opens up running lanes. I think if you do look at the read option ability that Hurts can can provide, provide with Miles Sanders, that opens up running lanes. So I don't think he has to focus necessarily on, hey, you know what, this guy's a strong arm because we've seen so many guys and Christian Ponder. Hmm. So like guys like that, yeah. you see the arms stuff like that. I mean, not putting yeah. Flacco compared to Flacco to Ponder, but it, when he could just see somebody's arm, you go, oh, wow, this guy's arm can, and you know that. But I think he can. He adds so much, so many elements to his game that he, he won't have to worry about Flacco. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I just brought up Joe because you know we were talking about the coaches, Chris, jumping into drills, and Shane Steichen was jumping into some of those quarterback drills. Yeah. And the poor guy's catching slants, and I'm like, oh, oh he's got a <laughs> dislocated finger <laughs> catching, <laughs> catching Joe's. But, yeah, he's like a, he's 6'6", 245. He's like a power pitcher in baseball. 
but it takes other things to play the position. And at his age and his inability to get out of the pocket, extend plays, I don't think it's a competition at all, but I, he could still still sling it, though. I will yeah. say that. I do want to bring up corner because Darius Slay was not there. Um, no big deal. But it does make you noticeable. I'm, I'm watching the cornerbacks were on the far field. And I'm watching the rotations. And Avante Maddox is the cornerback one through all the rotations. I mean, if you could think about – forget about a serious injury. We wish serious injury on no one. But you can imagine if Avante Maddox sprains his ankle before the season opener in Atlanta. Julio Jones isn't traded. Yeah, Julio. Calvin Ridley, uh, Kyle Pitts, and Avante Maddox is your cornerback one. Can this team go into this season without adding maybe multiple bodies at cornerback? They need another veteran one, and Steven Nelson is still I, – I, 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 if I'm Steve, I know Steven Nelson's playing it right, making people yeah. bait, bait and, and, and driving his price up. And also, if I'm – I think he's the number one. He's got to be the number one target for them because right now, I, I still see Maddox is still an inside guy. He's a, yeah. he he mentioned yesterday like when we were talking to him, he he's using his eyes more to improve and get to the right spots, and he's working on some things. And the team seems to be, by the way, the moves that the team's made so far, it seems like they're comfortable with him being an outside corner. I just personally think he's a little bit better on the inside. And if you add a guy like Nelson on the outside, it just makes that secondary a lot better. So. They still do need to add some pieces. I mean, Zach McPherson is still unknown. We haven't seen him in, in an actual game himself right now. And for all we know, he could be good, but he's still a rookie. And rookies, uh, rookie cornerbacks tend to struggle early. So they, they still need to add, a, a, in my, they, they need to go after Nelson and do whatever they can to get him. Because if not, it's going to be that, that, mat, that opening day matchup could be really, really, yeah. really tough. I mean, I look at Jeffrey Okuda from last season. I think he was the third overall pick, and he struggled mightily. Yeah. And I see people, you know, God bless them for the optimism, thinking Zach McPherson as a fourth-round pick can go out there and, and play at a high level as a rookie. I, I how he says hope is not a strategy. That is not a strategy in my <laughs> estimation. It, it's it's really because it, all it's going to take is the first double move, and then the last. You don't want to lose the, the guy to lose confidence early on, and then it just snowballs. So th they have to get a, a, another setting force and and a, another name. I'm I'm shocked. I don't think he would come back, but Nikel Roby Coleman's still sitting out there too. He's still, I, yeah. I don't think he'd be the number one option, but if it gets closer to the season, you don't still don't have a veteran corner. You may have to bring him back for at least for another year just to see, just to shore up some things. So it's, it's Do tough. you think, and this is pure speculation, none of us really know, so I'm asking you guys to uh, look into your football crystal ball a little bit here. Um, we, we're going to continue to debate how much input the coaching staff, mostly the head coach, is going to have on who's going to play. Uh, we know that the general manager is going to be in consultation with who's going to be active, who's going to be on the roster on any given Sunday. But when the game is ongoing, you're hoping that the coaching staff is making the decision as to who's going to play. We don't know that yet with the relationship between Nick Sirianni and Howie Roseman. Do you think rookies will be given that big time shot this year? Because it is a transition year. The owner did tell us that. The Eagles did make the draft picks that they made, and they were Howie draft picks. How do you think, for a rookie coach, rookie status will impact who is or isn't going to play for the Birds this year? I think he'll have – I think they will see a lot of the young guys get some a lot of playing time early. And the reason to say that is, especially with all those picks, if they don't make the move to get the big-name quarterback like Deshaun Watson use all those picks next year – yeah, they have a bunch of first rounds. I want to. I think they want to see what they have, and and then start to build. Really, really use all those assets to build for the next year. Overall, if I had to put the crystal ball in there, I think Nick Sirianni will have a lot of say early, and then I think over time you may start to see more. Hey, you know, I think you need to go at it a little more 
of a lot more phone calls from the front office as the season goes on. I think we need to go ahead and put yeah. this guy in to see it because I really see it. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. So I, I think there, I think th- there will be a lot of playing time with these young guys. You know, Chris, you brought up the name, so I'm going to have to go down this road to Sean Watson. Um, I I thought about it from Jalen Hurts' perspective. Look, he's going to be the starting quarterback of this team. We just talked about it. Um, I think people are going to be surprised uh, by the Eagles if the offensive line stays healthy. But long term, you talk about those three but likely first round picks two right now, likely to become three, all the money they're going to have by taking the, the harsh medicine on the Carson Wentz contract. They can go get any quarter quarterback they want next off season. Can Jalen hurts do anything this season to take that off the table? If somebody like Deshaun Watson becomes available, becomes free becomes free of the legal implications. That's a top five player. That's a top five quarterback. Can he do anything to say, oh, we're not going to look at Deshaun Watson if we're the Philadelphia Eagles? If he's able to make this offense into a top 10 offense and he shows that he continues to improve, especially late later in the season and the team is somehow within, probably say, in a wild card hunt, I think he could. I think he can. I think he has the tools necessary. I think he has the tools to be a a really good quarterback in this league. And if he's able to be in the top ten, I think if that offense is a top ten and it shows a lot of promise, you can look to use those assets elsewhere. Now, if he comes out flat and the offense sputters and you start, you make some questionable decisions, and you're wondering like, what? Well, hey, you wonder why he's thrown into double coverage all the time and he's lead among the league leaders in office, or say he has a Carson Wentz type year last year, then I don't think I think the calls are gonna go a lot greater. And then they're looking to bring in bring in Watson. They'll have Houston on speed dial trying to talk in the offseason. But I think if if he's able to if that offense is is really humming during the season, I think uh Howie Roseman and the rest of that front office are gonna look to use those assets elsewhere. And I like the way that you stated it. If the offense is top 10, because part of the evaluation is certainly going to be his own passer rating and his numbers. But if the offense is moving and he's the guy who's running it, I think he should get credit for it. But for that to be the case, others are going to have to step up. Certainly the running game, Miles Sanders, uh, guys' ability to make plays uh, above and beyond the quarterback. Um, Part of that is the tight end position. And I know he was also somewhat conspicuous by his absence yesterday. And that's Zach Ertz. Um, nothing is certainly going to be decided at this point uh, till a week from now when we get to that June 1st designation. And any move the Eagles make will be an easier pill to swallow as far as the salary cap goes. Uh, did you? Did anyone mention Zach Ertz yesterday? Is he just a out-of-sight, out-of-mind guy? Or do you think there is the chance that the Eagles will still say, well, Zach, we're going to have a camp. And then the word mandatory will be attached. And you will be expected to show up, even if you're not happy about it. Uh, was was anyone contemplating Zach Ertz yesterday? No, I think everybody was trying to figure out, see if if uh, Jack Stoll was going to be was was a good uh, backup ready to go. And it, 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 it was weird. It, to be honest, it was weird not to see him out there. We, I mean, everybody knew the situation, but it's just it was just different because so, so many years you look and feel, hey, there's 86 right there, but it. I think it mandatory. I think he even. I think he still sits out even if it was mandatory. I think the time is. I think he really is done in Philadelphia. And the only way I see it, the only way I probably see it, him coming back is if no team whatsoever decides to offer any, offer anything to the Eagles. And I think even if Zach went out and talked to, hey, you know what, we try to work these deals out, and he comes back and the Eagles pull me, go, hey, we're sorry, we just what. This sorry this happened, and but I don't foresee that happen. I really think he he played his last snap here in Philadelphia. Chris, um, I think the biggest competition for this team when training camp starts, and by the way, that's official. It's going to be July twenty seventh. League is doing a whole league wide thing, so just about everybody is starting on the same day. But um, it's going to be left tackle. It's going to be Jordan Mailata. 
It's going to be Andre Dillard. I know the fans want Jordan to have the job. I know the fans don't like Andre Dillard. I get heat for saying he's not the worst person in the world on a daily basis. Um, how do you see that shaping up? Jordan has tremendous physical ability, but he's still raw. He's still, even though he's this will be his fourth year in, I mean, he was starting from ground zero. Is Andre Dillard uh, going to be the left tackle of this team or Jordan Mailata? I think Jordan Mailata is, and I say it for one factor, one main factor. I mean, both are athletic. Both can get out in space and both have the, both are developing their technique. But I think the one thing that Mylotta has that Dillard doesn't have is that nastiness you need in an offensive lineman. If you're going to be the be- if you're going to be the left tackle, the guy that's tasked with protecting the quarterback's blind side, you need to have that nastiness, that that edge that stops you from that say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to let you go by. I'm not going to let you beat me. I'm going to take the fight to you. And I saw that a lot more in Mylotta than when Dillard was in there. And not to say that Dillard doesn't have that heart. But I see my Alada, it just seems like he has that extra intangible to when he comes to playing that left tackle spot. And if the Eagles can somehow get, I, I mean, I, I don't think Dillard, I think if, if that happens, they have to move Dillard in some way because I don't think we, we saw what happened when Dillard went to the right tackle spot. Mm-hmm. And it, that, that was kind of, yeah. So you're going to have to move him. And uh, I mean, there's value in left tackle. Maybe he goes somewhere else and he has a, he, he has, he, redeveloped his career and it flourishes again, but I'd probably give the edge to my lot right now. Maybe that's how you get a cornerback. People hey, don't think about perfect. the trade market. Flip yeah. a left tackle for a cornerback. And left tackle has a lot of value too. Yeah. So yeah, that, that that's a good way to bring them in. Good point. Well, the Eagles can put themselves in the best position by both of those guys playing well in the preseason and the decision coming down. If they're going to wait till then, uh, my guess would be, it would be late in the preseason right before the season starts. Uh, but the other team is going to want to do it earlier to get him up to speed. We'll have to see how that, that shakes out. Uh, I need your opinion on the aggressiveness of this Eagles de- defense. This is something John and I have discussed uh, previously on the show. I've been in town watching the birds longer than either of you two guys. I think I know what Eagle fans like to see on the defense side of the ball. They want aggression. They want sacks. They want hard hits, too, which is not really part of the National Football League anymore. So they've already had that taken away from them. So Eagle fans just want to see sacks. Reggie White would bring the house up at the vet as much as Randall Cunningham ever did because this is a defense-crazed town, always has been, always will be. That's why I like the Ryan Kerrigan signing because I do believe he will get sacks and it will get the hometown crowd (laughs) excited on days that the Eagles are playing down in South Philly. The way the defensive coordinator is going to deploy his players certainly fits into that. Uh, Johnny Mack was a bigger Schwartz fan than I was. I thought he was a good defensive coordinator. John thought he was better than good, top guy, and one of the top guys in the league. I don't want to speak for Johnny. He can speak for himself in a second, but he's a bigger Schwartz fan than I was um, because I'm not sure he was as aggressive as I wanted to see or I thought Eagle fans wanted to see. Is Gannon going to be aggressive? Is he going to be a bring the house guy, blitz on most obvious downs, bring it from everywhere, corner, safety, linebackers, and the like? How do you think his defense is going to play on third and long? I he said he likes to he he, he likes to mix them up, but I really like the, if he's from the true Zimmer school of defense. I'm really excited to see how he uses that double A gap blitz. And how the two linebackers coming up the middle and threatening to go, and because it just creates so much chaos for the center and the quarterback, whoever's whoever signing those offensive line protections, because they're look your quarterback, you're looking like okay, I have to worry about these two linebackers coming up the quickest way possible up the middle, and then oh yeah, since that they're coming up that way and the line adjusts, then you have the defensive ends, you have Brandon Graham, Josh Sweat, Derek Barnett, or Ryan Kerrigan coming from the outside. I, I mean, they I think they could still get a lot of pressure from their front four. But I wouldn't be surprised they blitz those linebackers a little bit more. And I think we see Jacoby Stevens well too. I mean, he's we I think if he gets if he proves himself that he can play a lot and him being like that in that, that quasi big nickel coming in at the linebacker, you have him come with his speed coming possibly off. There's so many combinations they can do. So I think Gannon definitely will be aggressive. I still think Schwartz was a good, and, and I know it's going off a little bit. I still think Schwartz was a good defensive coordinator. I mean, the ultimate goal of the defense is to stop people and not let them score points, and he was able to do that. 
I think Gannon, if Gannon's able to do that and be aggressive, I think he'll be beloved in this town. So I think I think we'll see a lot of I think we will see a lot of aggression out of Gannon. All right, last one from me, Chris. Thanks for joining the show. Read Chris and NJOnline.com, also with other friend of the show, Mike K. Uh, but to follow it up on, on, on Gannon and, you know, Mike Zimmer and that philosophy, my concern, and I love, I love the A-gap blitz. I love the overload blitz that Zimmer uses, but he's using Anthony Barr and Eric Kendricks. He's not using – Alex Singleton and Eric Wilson, when he did use Eric Wilson last year, didn't work too well because Anthony Barr wasn't in there. Um, Aggression can work both ways. And the one thing is if you blitz and you don't get there, all of a sudden that back end with no cornerbacks is (laughs) left open. (laughs) So from Jody's perspective, from my perspective, I think we're going to see more cover two and cover three than anything from Jonathan Gannon. You can see that, but also when it comes to this, I think a lot a lot of these guys being more speed guys, under guys, and fast guys, I think he can compensate sometimes. So if you have you can you still run a cover two and, and, and on the back end and, and protect the safety the safety's protected and going man on the outside. I think you can still so you, you can, there's little ways you can go ahead and disguise it and and and, and utilize it, but even if you don't get home, I think these the linebackers are second day. They have enough speed and, and, and to keep up with some of these receivers now. If they're able to do that, I mean, the outside guys I worry about. The inside guys, I don't. I'm not worried about so much. I, I worry about those outside receivers when they're going on there. But I think even if they still blitz, I think they'll. They, I think they yeah. this this front set, the front four, and if you go seven with the blitz, I think they can get there. But in the back end, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. The brilliance of of John Gannon, I think it's going to be, and this is just my, you know, Sean McVay calls it offensively the illusion of complexion. I think defensively it's going to be the illusion of aggression. He's actually going to be less aggressive, but fans are going to think he's more aggressive because he's going to show those A-gap and and overload looks, whereas Jim didn't. But I think on the back end, He's going to be really, really safe about it. But that's just my prediction. <laughs> we'll, we'll certainly see how it uh, plays out. All right, Chris, let's finish here. Week one of the regular season, the Eagles will be down in Hotlanta. Julio Jones will be in. Falcon, black and red. Eagle, white and green. <laughs> or somewhere else in the National Football League uh, come week one with another squad. I think it'll be Patriot Blue. Okay. <laughs> I think it, I like it. the Patriots turn their roster upside down during this offseason. Why not add a Julio Jones while you're at it? That would make a lot of sense. Chris, great stuff. Appreciate you coming on board. You know, we'll have you on again. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, guy. Thank you guys so much. A lot of fun. Appreciate it. Have Thanks, a great uh, Memorial Day weekend. We are the Mac and Mac guys here on Birds 365. We'll come back, set up hour number two of the show, which will include an appearance from Mike Garofolo. Philly guy from the NFL Network. He'll join us a little later here on Birds 365. If you missed any of today's show on the Jacob Media channel, listen to the podcast on your way home. Available on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify. If you missed any of today's show on the Jacob Media channel, listen to the podcast on your way home. Available on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify.